Welcome to this week's episode of Kent's Garage. When I left you last week, I had just removed all the brake calipers and flexible brake hoses from this 1967 250 SL. And earlier today, I brought in the owner and I went over what we were looking at here in terms of options to repair it. There actually are a number of different options and I wanted him as the owner to make the decision because I could tell him, oh yeah, just spend a lot of money and replace everything or we could go over some less expensive options, but he has to understand the risks involved and the potential for problems down the road. So we did that. So I decided, you know, this is an opportunity to maybe do a couple other videos on this subject of brakes and issues that you might have with brakes. I'm making some notes here, by the way, and I think there's about three other videos I could do on this subject. And I don't think I want to put them all in the Kent's garage because it just make those episodes too long. But I will be able to link you or at least give you the links to these other videos as we go through this week's episode. First off, you know, I have these brand new calipers here. I said we can put brand new Ate calipers on this. And if you haven't priced these recently, I'll let you do the research. Just Google it. See what new calipers cost for a 250 SL, okay? So the other option, of course, is rebuilding them. And that brings up a whole other subject. Are these rebuildable? How can you tell if your calipers are rebuildable? What are some quick tests you can do to make that decision? And I did that for John, and I showed him some of the results. And so that's gonna be one of these other videos. And the title of the video is, do I rebuild or do I replace? And how can I tell which one I should do? The other one, which I thought was an excellent subject that could probably take a whole half hour, is how do you prevent sticking brake problems? Now, I'm sure some of you will say, Kent, that's obvious. Just change your brake fluid. Just look at this dirty brake fluid that we pulled out of here. I don't know when it was last changed, but I will agree that lack of frequent brake fluid changes is one of the chief causes of sticking brakes. But it's not the only reason. Yes, you should be changing your brake fluid every two years. If you have a car that only gets driven a couple times a year and you live in a high moisture environment like the Pacific Northwest, you should change the brake fluid every year. Because remember, brake fluid absorbs moisture. It absorbs moisture right into the fluid. And that's one of the key causes of corrosion inside these calipers. And that's what makes them stick, and that's what makes them overheat. You know, we actually got to looking at these rotors here, and I noticed that even though the rotor looks pretty good, you know, there's not a ridge, not deep scoring, it's blue. And the owner confirmed that, yes, these got really, really hot. So we're going to change the rotors. Rotors are not that expensive, and it's not worth the risk. He may find out later on as he drives his car and hits the brakes, he'll get a little brake pedal chatter, and that's indicative of, you know, a warped rotor. But, you know, these are so inexpensive. I never recommend you turn the rotors, just replace them on these Mercedes. A lot of times you take them to a machine shop and you have them turned, and what happens is you get them right down on the thin side of tolerance, and then, of course, they get hot and they warp. So you end up having to replace them down the road anyway. So I don't machine rotors for Mercedes-Benz. I just replace them when they get heavily scored, or you have a lip on the edge. But these are fine, but they're blue, they're hot. So they're gonna get replaced. The ones in the front are okay. Uh, no problem, we're gonna leave those rotors in place. I'll take and clean the rotors up. There's a little bit of rust on the outer edges and maybe later on I'll show you the tool I use to clean the rust off the rotor. Those are two more videos. The other video is how do you rebuild these brake calipers anyway if you're gonna do it yourself. And I already have a couple of videos on YouTube about you know, getting out the stuck pistons, if they're really stuck. And I'm going to put a link in the show more of this episode and send you to those videos. There's no sense in me repeating all this in this episode. The other thing is I have a complete kit with all some special tools and equipment that you're going to need when you rebuild these calipers yourself. And then, of course, that comes with a very lengthy uh, on-demand video that I have on my website that takes you step-by-step step to taking the caliber apart, cleaning it, and then reinstalling. And by the way, it's critical that you get some of these pistons on certain models, that you get some of these pistons back in at the correct orientation. You don't just shove them back in the caliper housing. And of course, we have 
the flexible brake hoses, we have the brake fluid. And by the way, I only recommend a very high quality DOT4 brake fluid that has what is called LMA, low moisture absorption. This is really critical. Don't just put cheap brake fluid back in your old car if it's not being driven. You really want that high quality uh, brake fluid to keep it from absorbing so much moisture and then rusting your calipers up again. So this is the Pitocin that we sell on my website. So we have all those resources. We have, you know, bleeding equipment and so on. So I'm going to go ahead now. We're going to take and open these up. I'm going to clean them first, then we're going to open them up. And I'll come back probably tomorrow and show you what these look like on the inside before we make the final decision Okay, should we rebuild these or should we install new ones? I've opened up the front calipers, but we didn't open up the rear ones yet, and I'll explain that in a minute. But what we found inside was really, really messy and dirty. On this one front caliper, the first one we popped open, it's just filthy, full of like rusty crud and junk, both down inside the bores, all over the pistons. So we got to thinking, hey, maybe we could come up with a kit that would allow an owner to flush a caliper, kind of like flushing your power steering fluid. You know, set up a rig and pump fluid through it and flush out all that crud. Because what I've learned over the years is that just flushing the brake fluid through the system on these old cars that haven't had flushes on a regular basis does not get all this crud out. It gets it out of the lines, gets it out of the master cylinder, gets it out of, a, a, you know, part of the, of the caliper, but it doesn't flush it all out. So. What we did is we rigged up a tank, we got compressed air, we got all kinds of little things together and we decided, let's see if we can flush a caliper. You know, you can see this one that we flushed out with a combination of brake fluid and alcohol is a whole lot cleaner than this first one. So what did we learn from all this, by the way? Well, I think the importance of a regular brake fluid flush is number one and then for those cars that you don't drive very often, you may want to do this power flush maybe like every four or five years. Just to make sure you get any crud out that's kind of built up over time. So, you know, I don't think there's any uh, magic solution here, but I do believe that if you have one of these old Mercedes, 30 years and older, and you don't know much about the history of the brake calipers, I would recommend that you go ahead and take them off and reseal them. Your only other option is new. We're looking at new rear caliper right here. The owner has opted not to rebuild these even though they may be rebuilding. They're stuck, totally frozen on one piston on each one. And I explain the situation to them. I do have a kit using hydraulics that can help you force a stuck piston out of a caliper. But he said, hey, look, I, let's just go ahead and go with new ones. Because even if I get these taken apart, I may find excessive rust and pitting down inside. So currently these are about $350 a piece new or more, depending upon where you buy them for this 250SL. In the future, I guarantee these will go up in the five, $600 range per piece. And then suddenly they will no longer be available. So I would highly recommend you take care of your brake calipers on your older Mercedes right now by doing the regular service. And these are fairly easy to change, particularly if they're not rusted on the hub. I've got another video out there on how to get these off the hub if they've been rusted. But look at these on this 250SL. Someone was nice enough, a previous mechanic, and I want to congratulate him. He was nice enough to smear a little anti-seize compound right here on the hub and right on this edge. So there's no rust in there. They just came right off. And then I'm going to install one of our rotors. I really like these rotors because they have this special coating on them to keep them from rusting on that center section and on the back. Look at this OE AT rotor. See how much rust is on it on the edge and on the hub there. So this is an improvement, believe it or not. This is actually better than OE. So we're going to install these new rotors now and then we're going to put the new calipers on because we found out that rebuilding these calipers it was just not possible. We'll be sure and see my other videos on why he's going to have to spend so much money fixing the brakes on this 250SL.
My favorite tool of the week is this little air die grinder with this fiber pad that I use to clean off the rust on these old brake rotors. There's nothing really wrong with this brake rotor that you see in this picture, but it does have a little bit of rust along that outside edge. So watch how slick it is to put the pad. They just twist lock right onto that little adapter. Once you get it tightened on there, watch how this works. You can just keep spinning the rotor as you work the fiber pad along that outer edge to get all the rust off. Be sure to wear a dust mask when doing this and a face shield. The brake repair on this 250 SL is done. And for John, it was an expensive repair. We had to install new calipers on all four wheels, new brake hoses, new rear rotors, all new pads, and a new master cylinder. So it, <laughs> it gets expensive on these older models. And I know there's ways you can avoid some of this. I'm absolutely convinced. And I'm doing a separate video now, by the way, on how to prevent this situation from occurring in your own car. Ways to prevent problems with sticking brakes. And I list them in order of what I would call frequency. And number one, by the way, I think is lack of use. Uh, I think that's even slightly above lack of frequent fluid changes or brake fluid flushes, I should say. But on this car, because it only gets driven in the summer, you have to understand that the pistons inside those calipers hardly move at all. And because it's not driven a lot and the pads don't wear down, that even accelerates the problem. And then, of course, if you don't flush the fluid every year or two years at the maximum, you get all that junk and crud accumulating down in the caliper like you saw earlier in this video. And that just accelerates the rust because when we did take the front calipers apart, even though they were moving freely, we had rust pitting along the upper edge of the piston. Now, you may have been able to get away with it, but with brand new pads, you got those pistons pushed all the way in, and they probably would have leaked. So in the end, we couldn't even save the front calipers. So what I've decided to do, and I've really been motivated from this, is, okay, if the, if the two main reasons why this occurs is lack of brake fluid flushes or crud junk down in the caliper, and lack of exercise, I've decided I'm going to try to come up with what I'm going to call the brake caliper exercise and flush kit. Because they don't get exercise enough just by driving the car. There has to be a better way to exercise those pistons. And also, flushing them just doesn't happen by, you know, putting new brake fluid in the system. They really need to be flushed out. And we went and did some experimenting uh, using some different techniques, trying to force clean the inside of the calipers. So that's my project for the next couple of weeks. I got a new kit. I'm on the hunt. I'm going to come up with the brake caliper flush and exercise kit. So stay tuned. You'll probably hear about it in one of the future episodes of Kent's Garage. But right now, I just want to show you this as we wrap this job up. I've got my mechanic in the car. We're going to hit the brakes. This is going to give you an idea what the brakes should look like when it's working properly. Okay, I'm just going to spin the wheel. You'll feel a little bit of drag here because of the emergency brake. We did adjust the emergency brake, by the way. Okay, now go ahead and hit the brakes. Hit the brakes hard. Okay, now release the brake. Now notice this. I'm hardly pushing. See that? Hit the brake again. <clears throat> okay, release the brake. Look at that. I'm not having to go like this to get it loose. And that's how a good brake should work on a car that has uh, disc brakes using calipers like these old Mercedes spins. So you can see I'm kind of excited about this new kit because I really think it can be a big help to a lot of you who own and drive these old classic Mercedes occasionally and you don't want to have to go through what John just went through and have to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to repair the brake system. In the last episode, I asked you viewers to give me some tips on how to get this top latch down because it had shrunk from being back in that rear boot for the last four years. And I had a lot of good answers. I think a lot of you realize that, you know, heat's got to 
be the key here, and some of you have been through this process. One fella came up with a really good idea about taking the top off and stretching it over a framework. Well, that's obviously if you have a really bad problem, but this one wasn't that bad. I use the old trick I've always used in the past, and that stick a heater inside. I think it's probably warm enough now. You got to be careful. You don't want to overheat the inside of the car. So just a small electric heater like this is going to do the job. And I, that since most of the problem is back in this area where the plastic window is, it's really important you get that plastic window softened up as well as this area around the edges of the bows. So here's what I do next. I latch the front just so the pin is in the hole. I don't latch it down tight. And then I lubricate that latch in the back. And once I heat the top, I'll come back here like this and give this a good, okay, that locked in. Now I couldn't do that earlier today before I heated the inside of the top, but this plastic window is very warm. It's not hot, but it's very warm to the touch. Now I can go forward, grab the lock handle in here and just tighten it down. I'll go do the other one on the other side and I'm done. You know, the top is nice and tight now. The important thing is I need to encourage the owner not to leave it down for years and years and years. What I do on my 280SL is I know it's a little work, but every time I drive the car, you know, if I'm going to park it for a couple days without going out in the sun, I put the top up and latch it down. So there you have it. Thanks for the input. We got the top latched down. We're ready to roll. The 250SL is finished and the owner's going to pick it up tomorrow. So I've rolled in our next project. This belongs to a good friend of mine. In fact, he's the fellow that got me into Mercedes-Benz years ago. This is a beautiful W123 300 TD wagon with a turbo diesel engine in it. And, you know, I want to help him out because he's been a great friend over the years. And, of course, uh, this whole business that's evolved around Mercedes-Benz for me came from his enthusiasm for Mercedes and his constant prodding, come on, Kent, you got to get a Mercedes-Benz. So here's the problem. He's starting to complain more about the ride and the rear suspension. Now this wagon has what's called SLS, self-leveling suspension. And if you've been around these wagons, you know they can be kind of troublesome to fix and kind of expensive to repair when they go bad on you. The solution, by the way, is not to convert them to standard springs and shocks. It kind of ruins the whole purpose of having a station wagon that can carry a heavy load in the rear end, particularly if you have a third seat back there. So we're going to go and do a little troubleshooting for him. I said, I'm going to try to figure out what's wrong. You know, is it, is it uh, struts are bad? Is it the uh, nitrogen spheres? Is it the pump? Is it this? Is it the self-leveling valve? A lot of times it's a combination of everything and what I've learned with these SLS systems, if you kind of let one thing go, let's say, and he kind of agrees, yes, it started out riding kind of like a buckboard. Well, that, what that means is those nitrogen spheres have leaked and the fluid is not giving and them won't allow the shocks or the struts to move up and down. And what that does is put extra stress on the struts and then the struts can wear out. And if you keep driving it that way, then the springs can wear out because you've taken all the load off the strut and put it on the, the springs, which are weaker than the springs on a sedan. Okay, so if you're gonna own one of these old Mercedes-Benz with self-leveling suspension, you need to take care of it. If it starts misbehaving, don't neglect fixing it right away because it wears other things out. We're gonna find out just how bad this is, all right? But take a look here. This isn't always the best test. I've driven the car and I notice it does have a little bit of a, a bucking ride, but at the same time, it's going up and down. Watch this, see? Look at the roll and when I let go of it, it's still bouncing. <laughs> so if it were just the spheres or the accumulators, it would be really rough to move up and down and it would stop immediately. So this could be a situation where we have both the accumulators and both the struts worn out. So I think the next step is to get this up on the lift. Uh, earlier when I started the engine, I just loosened up the cap to the reservoir and I checked to make sure there's fluid in there and I checked to make sure the fluid's flowing. And that seems to be okay. Uh, sometimes you think, oh, if I just change, it's gonna be fine. Probably not in this case, okay? We may have multiple problems. We have may 
may be more than just two things. There may be three or four things wrong with the system, and that's what happens because just think about how old this car is. It's pretty old. I currently have three cars here that have SLS or self-leveling suspension. I have my 560 SEC, which has a system very similar to this, and then I have my S600 Coupe, once again has SLS, then I have this wagon. They all operate on the same principle, but they have a little bit different design, and each one is slightly different, but they all have a similar system. So over the next few weeks, this may be over the next month or so, I'm going to start going through all three of these cars. Uh, the 560 SEC, I think, needs the struts replaced. The S600 needs some uh, leveling height adjustment. And of course, this wagon, I'm not sure what it needs. <laughs> so maybe in the next episode of Kent's Garage, we'll get back in here, and I'll show you what I find this week as I look into the problems on this station wagon, and then maybe in future episodes, we'll be looking at the 560 SEC and then the S600. We'll kind of cover the whole gamut of SLS, or self-leveling suspensions. So, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Until we see you again, safe motoring always.